Final part, the competent parent from the surviving parent, chapter three, in the book, The Loss That Is Forever. The competent parent. Although many of the stories in this chapter describe parents whose own grief and confusion prevented them from parenting their children, at least for a time, there are also stories of parents whose competence and ongoing nurturing were a source of inspiration and support for their children. For the most part, these parents do not share their own mornings with their children. First and foremost, they remain parents and find other adults with whom they can mourn and from whom they can get the support they need. They may be withdrawn from a, for a period of time, but they quickly resume the roles of being mothers and fathers and provide a constant steady support to their children. Repeatedly, the adult children of such surviving parents recall that their parents took parenting seriously and made raising their children their number one job. It is not surprising that children see this as the height of a parent's competence and worthiness. Worthiness. These were parents who felt they had a job to do and set about to do it well. In the sample of people with whom I spoke, these parents were by and large mothers who assumed a competent role within the family and who allowed the family to continue with as little disruption as possible. Excuse me. In most cases, these the, they were models of courage and determination. Women who did not initially have the skills to support and raise their families alone, but who acquired those skills and did so with a minimum amount of disruption to their families. They assumed new roles and grew into a competence that served as an inspiration and a model for their children. When Luke's father was killed suddenly in a car accident, his mother was an unemployed school teacher whose teaching certificate had long ago expired. The summer after her husband died, Luke's mother packed up her three children, took them to a state university, pitched a tent where the family lived for the summer, and got the credentials she needed in order to return home and teach in the fall. She tried to turn their trip to state college into an adventure and enlisted her children in catching butterflies and helping her with her biology assignments. Luke remembers feeling that his mother saw her mission as raising her children. Luke remembers feeling that his mother saw her mission as raising her children. It was a job she wanted to do well. Luke's mother did not marry again until she was in her early 60s, and all of her children were successfully launched into their own lives. Although he never asked her, he assumed that this was purposeful, and that his mother felt that she could not return, not turn her attention to her own life until the mission of raising her children was accomplished. When Jason's father was killed in Vietnam, his mother was only 21. Her husband had been her high school sweetheart, the only boy she had ever loved. When he died, he left her with one small son and a baby on the way. Although she lived near her large family all of her life, Jason's mother became determined to raise her two children on her own. She never dated, saying she wanted no distractions in bringing up her children and she used the money she received from the Veterans Administration to take her children on trips and provide special treats and entertainments so they would not feel deprived. 
When Jason's younger sister graduated from college, he remembers that the family had a big outdoor barbecue. At one point, a delivery truck drove up with a huge bouquet of flowers. Jason assumed that the flowers were for his sister, probably from one of her many boyfriends. Instead, the flowers were for Jason's mother, a token of recognition from her own parents with a card that said, You've done just fine. We're very proud of you. Jason is filled with tremendous respect for his mother. Just as he feels that his father served his country, he believes that his mother served her family with the same level of integrity and honor. Jason senses that he has a great deal of respect for all women because of the example that his mother set. Patrick thinks that his mother also took care of her family. She chose a more traditional route. After Patrick's father died, his mother began to look for a new husband. She had a young son and she herself was a young woman. She wanted a man who would make her family whole. When she remarried, she chose a man who willingly accepted Patrick as his son. Throughout her loss and her remarriage, Patrick recalls that his mother remained loving, warm, and supportive, always there for him. Within two years, however, Patrick's mother's second husband also died, leaving her once again widowed, now this time with two children. After a period of several years, Patrick's mother again began to search for a husband who would complete her family. And again, she chose a man who welcomed Patrick and his sister with open arms. Patrick remembers feeling well cared for by his mother and believing that she was doing all she could to create a loving family for all of them. Patrick's mother's third marriage has been a long and successful one. And Patrick feels that throughout all of her ordeals, she has remained a steady and loving force. She has always been there for him and has remained his biggest fan and booster. Patrick has seen his mother's optimism and hope for the future as her most powerful quality. She never lets circumstances get her down. And that is what Patrick has learned from her and taken into his own life. For Jack, it was not only his mother's competence, but her love, attention, and guidance that allowed him to get through the trauma of his father's death. Jack was a teenager when his father died and felt acutely the loss of a man who would have been a model and a mentor for him. Jack says, my mother became the sun around which we all orbited. She became so much more important because she was all we had. In the first year following her husband's death, Jack's mother spent her time caring for her children, doing volunteer work and reestablishing her life as a single woman. After a year, however, she returned to work not out of financial necessity, but because she wanted to have a career and an independent life away from her children. Jack said he saw his mother grow strong and confident, and he felt he could lean on her throughout his own turbulent adolescence. For many years following his father's death, Jack floundered. He did not know how to direct his own energy and attention. School seemed too unstructured, and he took a variety of courses, never really focusing on anything he liked or to which he could make a commitment. His mother stood by him throughout his difficult times. As he says, she gave me the freedom I needed to experiment. She prodded me when I needed it, and finally she gave me the big boot when that was warranted. When I think back on what life would have been like if my father had lived, I wonder if he would have been able to handle me quite as well. Jack also realizes that he would never have gotten to know his mother as he has if his father had lived. 
His primary relationship probably would have been with his father, and he and his mother would have developed a more distant connection. Jack is grateful for the close relationship he and his mother share, and he says, I will be indebted to her for the rest of my life. I feel very lucky to have had her as my mother. She is not only a loving woman, but she has been in my corner 100% always reassuring me and standing by me. What is particularly striking is that all of the adult children who recalled their surviving parent as being competent are sons remembering mothers. It may be that the mother feels that they must be strong for their sons who have lost Mothers, it may be that mothers feel that they must be strong for their sons who have lost the role model of a competent father. These mothers present their sons with an image of competence so necessary for their own development into adulthood. Adult men. Surviving mothers may feel freer to reveal their vulnerabilities to their daughters who then assume a caretaking companion role. Some of what sons look for from fathers is a sense of accomplishment in the world, a belief that one can bring order and control to external events. Sons fear that when fathers die, competence and a sense of control die with them. Consequently, when mothers are unable to function competently, Sons are both awed and reassured by their mother's performance. Parents always seem like giants to children. Parents are our protectors and our guides. When a child has two parents, two people share in that awesome responsibility. When there is only one parent, that parent truly looms larger than life. He or she becomes all important to survival, both practical and emotional. The child becomes not only acutely aware of the parent's feelings and vulnerabilities, but also acutely sensitive to those feelings. When there are two parents, a parent's temporary withdrawal or depression might go unnoticed. When there is only one parent, the unhappiness a child witnesses seems intolerable. In telling their stories of early loss, many people focused on the role of the surviving parent. As important as the loss was, equally important was the person who now became not the primary caretaker, but the only caretaker. The child came to know and experience the world through a single set of lenses. Thank you for listening. That's the end of three. Chapter four is called Personal Mythologies, and it is one of my absolutely favorite chapters from the book. I hope you'll come back and catch some more with me. I appreciate you listening.